to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for May 2nd, 2024. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Dolosky? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Lichter? Present. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Dr. Shea? Present. Dr. Elmendorf? Ms. Myers? Present. Ms. Stanberry? Present. Ms. Blotner? Present. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. Roller? Present. Ms. Brady? Present. Ms. Schumacher? And that's all we have. Okay, thank you. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members will then, that want to add any discussion, may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee members will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may have a roll call vote and assistants will then say each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay, sorry about my quick talking, but we have a lot to cover, so I'm trying not to waste any minutes. Um, the first thing that we're gonna do is continue the discussion we had at the last cur curriculum meeting about committee purpose and measures of effectiveness. Um, and then we are to take our thoughts to the full board um, at our meeting on Tuesday night. So um, just to review, and I sent this um, to some of our committee member, to our um, board members um, for their feedback. So this isn't new, it's what I used last time. Again, we're working to fill in this um, chart. Um, those are the questions that were posed by um, the chair of the board for us to, to do this work. And we reviewed those last time as well. And we started the discussion last time about the um, purposes the purpose of the curriculum committee. What is in black is what is currently in the Board of Ed handbook, which is also being revised. Um, so I wanted us to have the um, current version. Um, and then we had discussed the second blue bullet last time as far as whether we should define the scope of contracts that come before the curriculum committee. But then um, Ms. Domanowski also um, sent me a suggestion, which is that first bullet. Um, so, Ms. Dominowski, would you just speak to that suggestion? Um, was that, were you thinking that would be the total purpose or just a part of it? No, just a part. Maybe it would go under um, metrics. I'm not sure, just as part of something that, you know, we would do add to our purpose. So, you mean the fact yes, about okay. reviewing state and this part is kind of the new part, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, other comments from staff members? Now I'm having, I can only see me because I've got my, I'm sharing the screen. So I'm sure there's a way for me to do this better. But um, if there's any other board members that have a comment, please just chime in. Ms. Lichter, I have a comment. Please go ahead. And so the review of state or federal legislation, um, I, I do not believe that is the role of this curriculum committee. So what happens is when when there is something that comes from the federal level, it then goes to the state. The state either drafts law or policy around it. It then comes to the to the school district where policy has to be addressed around it. 
And so this is more along the lines to me for the policy committee um, or for um, or for the legislative committee for curriculum. I don't because if we get into this, if we start parsing out which legislation we're going to review for each one, um, then every committee is going to have this as a bullet point, and we're not looking holistically now um, as a, um, a you know holistically at the whole system of instruction. So so that bullet point I don't think should be here. I think the curriculum committee should solely focus on content. And anything else needs to be taken to the full board um, beyond that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Manaus, can you hit your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to speak to that. Uh, I wasn't saying that we should um, approve or disprove any curriculum um, legislation that's coming through state or, or uh, federal. I'm saying that we should review it so that we're aware of it and we understand it as part of the curriculum committee. What, so I think it would be helpful, especially when we are getting new curriculums when it comes to the health curriculum, curriculum and stuff like that, or things that get passed so that we understand what we are required to put in our curriculums. Um, I'm not saying that we need to dissect this or you know, add to it or advocate for any of it. I just would like us to be aware of, you know, any state. So a lot of times you say things like we're required to do that by state and federal. Well, it might be helpful for us to all understand that and what those state and federal legislations are. So the one um, I think today when the PowerPoint that we were given to look at about the health curriculum did a good job with what you're saying, Mr. Minowski, as far as including the state, the pieces from the state that are mandating the changes in the curriculum. Is that what the type of thing you're talking about? Yes, but I think maybe before we get the presentation on that, if something new gets passed, that we should, it should be included in, you know, in part of it. As, as instead of just like putting a little blip in there, we should explain it. Okay, other th thoughts, Ms. Stileski or Ms. Humphrey? I was just saying, it didn't come like I, I got, it's not, that wouldn't, we wouldn't be the only curriculum committee in Baltimore County or in Maryland um, in the school systems that, that has that included in their committee, their curriculum committee public um, purposes and goals. It's, I, I, I was researching what other curriculum committees in other counties were, you know, had in there purpose and goals, and that was one of the things that I, I saw. Thank you for that. Other, uh, Ms. Pumphrey? I, I can see, I can see both sides, honestly. Um, I do like t is in today's um, section about the health curriculum, how it was explained to us um, why the changes were necessary through legislation, but I also agree with what Ms. Booker Dwyer said as far as um, focusing on content, um, but maybe because it's a change in content, it applies because it's, you know, that part, part of us change the content has to do with legislation. Um, so those are my thoughts. Thanks. I don't know whether somewhere in the middle would be, we had talked the last time about possibility of a matrix. I think we had that under um, measures of effectiveness about creating a, a matrix or framework when discussing a contract. So would any pieces of legislation or policy be part of that matrix. I'm not sure if that's kind of somewhere in the middle. That that makes sense to me. I look at that as far as what we do at um, in PRC when the, any legislative or uh, you know, any laws or rules are placed in sort of that matrix of our you know analysis of the policies. So that's what I sort of see in relation like so if we had a matrix here that could be included where we're discussing how um, how state laws or um, code um, you know, uh, affects the curriculum that we're that we're reviewing. Thank you. Other thoughts, Ms. Dominowski, how do you feel about that being part of the matrix or framework? I like it. OK, Ms. Booker Dwyer, does that make more sense there to you? I would have to see what that looks like. As long as it's not in the purpose, I'm fine with it. OK, so I just want to so I don't know if you can see, but Mr. Lus I don't know if you can see, but Mr. Lusky's hands up as well. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, I can't. Ms. Lusky. Um, thank you. I I mostly want to echo what Ms. Pumphrey said. I can also appreciate both perspectives, but um, 
I do think, especially if it's providing context for um, new legislation, new legislation that would potentially affect new curriculum, um, it would be important as part of the context to look at um, the federal laws. And thank you, Ms. Dominowski, for looking into what the other school districts do in Maryland for that. Thank you. OK, so I kind of moved the statement. Um, we'd have to change it wording wise, but I put that with the matrix piece so that we don't lose that that idea. Um, but if we go back to the purpose, where is the purpose? Um, you know, so is the the purpose that's currently being used still applicable? Um, do we want to define the scope, um, which would be defining? We had talked about the three bullet points that are on the bottom, brand new curriculum, instruction or assessments, anything that's core or tier aligned with the four priorities or professional learning. Or do you want to leave it as is? Ms. Booker Dwyer. And so we would be reviewing new or revised curriculum. So are we are we only reviewing things that are we only reviewing content that is set to be adopted by the board? You mean voted on in contracts? Right. Um, Dr. DiDonato, do you want to respond to that question? When you're bringing stuff to us, you're bringing things beyond just what's going to curriculum, I mean, contracts committee, correct? Yes, yeah, so some might be, um, curricular shifts that are happening. So like, for example, the health one is a really good example. Like that's not going for a contract. It's an update about a curricular change that's happening. So we do bring ones that are not associated with, like information that's not associated with contracts just to provide the board update on certain content changes or maybe even exciting things that are happening with content. So it wouldn't be for an, a board action. It's just for information. Yes. And then what would we do with that information? Because that I guess that's what I'm getting at. So what are, what's the so it's great to have information if we could de clearly define in the purpose, the intent of. So we have here what it is we want to do and like what is the why it is to do what? Um, so I get if we're reviewing something that's new to inform, you know, the, the adoption, accept, acceptance, or how, whatever language we want to use. But then if it's something that's just being shared with us for information and there's nothing we can do about it, then, uh, you know, it, could that come out in a memo? Like, is there a meeting that's needed? So I, that's all I want. That's all I'm trying to get at. Like, what is the what and the why and the action that's going to happen because of it? OK, um, hold that thought. Well, Ms. Pumphrey, did you want to respond to that? Yes, I just my thinking is and I'm thinking specifically it applies overall, but I'm speaking. I'm thinking specifically to our discussion today about the health curriculum. I think the purpose uh, is, yes, we do need to have discussion about it. Um, it's an important enough change that um, we probably have questions or we may not, but it could it could bring about questions that we need to discuss in committee. Um, and I do think that's more appropriate in committee instead of in front of the full board because we get so much information um, that I think it may be too much um, to dive in deeply with each of these uh, changes um, from each uh, each committee um, through through the whole board. But I think um, I think the information itself could it could be presented as an information item to the full board, but the discussion should take place in committee. If I'm making sense. You are. Um, Ms. Booker Dwyer. And then I'm just wondering what will come from that discussion. So we sit around and we talk about this information and then what does it inform policy? Does it inform how we govern? That's all I'm that's all I want to get because I, I think, want to be really clear. Like it's great to get information, but if you give me information and then there's no action behind it or there's nothing that I'm doing with it, then you know, then it was just a nice update. Was that the best use of everyone's time? I agree, but I think it would depend on the discussion. So if we have questions, they it could pop very pop very well bring about policy changes. If something is concerning to us and we have questions and we're like, oh, well, we never thought about this, this might be something that um, we need to act on. 
Um, so I think it depends on the circumstance. I think it's very possible that we could get into a deep discussion and decide that um, we need to move, we need to act on a change. And so then would the policy say we would review curriculum and information to inform policy changes? Like, would that be the key thing there? Well, I why don't we use the three. health as an example? So if, if we weren't, so the health one is just more is just informational for correct, Dr. Di Donato. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. So so if we didn't if we didn't so that one would never have been brought anywhere. That and it doesn't even fit one of those three bullets either because it's not it doesn't fall in those three because it's not a contract. I have my hand is her hand up. Sorry. Okay, I was just, I'm sorry. I, didn't <laughs> anything. I just saw her hand like twice waving. Okay. No, sorry. thank you. I got to okay. figure out how to do this better. Go ahead. Um, we also owe it to our public for transparency reasons. If we are doing a new curriculum or changing a curriculum, this is the perfect place to um, present it to the public as opposed to bringing it before the full board. So any changes, any new books, any new anything like that, this is the perfect place to bring it forward just for that reason alone. That's it. Okay, I agree. Thank you. That's an important point. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer, is your hand up? Nope. Oh, is your hand yeah, still up? I agree with that as well. And I think that gets back to the original point. So Ms. Dominowski said if they're bringing new curriculum, new books, any of that. So that would all fall under the purview as what's here now. But oh, something like new. with the health standards, you know, this is something that you can that can be Googled. It's publicly available. So, so I, I appreciate getting the information about the health standards, but if our role is governance, then how are we using that information to inform a governance decision? What governance decision are we informing based off the information that's going to be shared with just sharing health standards? We're sharing with our public the standards that have changed. Those standards are new. with the public for on a state board meeting. Yeah, but I mean, not everyone's going to go Google the new health or paying attention. We're the ones that are supposed to be paying attention to it and presenting it. So I, I think we absolutely need to talk about because there's some changes in there. And if we're like, I mean, at least we're, if they're not paying attention to this, fine. But at least we said that we did bring it forward. They can't say I didn't know about these new changes. And you can't say, well, you can go Google it. That's not enough. Like, no, we talked about it in a open meeting. You can go find it. Here's the date. Um, I, I mean, we absolutely like. There's some, I mean, I don't understand why we wouldn't talk about that. It is a change. It's it's new. Um, it's our teaching our kids. I, I'm just confused as to why you, you don't think that's something that we should present to here. Actually, wouldn't it fit under the third bullet or for new curriculum or no? It would. I I okay. I was incorrect. It was brand new, so it would fit, or it's revised, but um. It's revised based on the revision to the health standard. Okay. Um, so it might be that this would need to say or revised if we. Um, but Ms. Booker Dwyer, to your point, when, as a full board, we're presented things that are just informational, that it's things that we don't act on, but we just inquire about, correct? Correct. So then this could be something that could be elevated to the full board because the full board would need to know um, the information. I, I I look at the committees like this is a working thing that we're working on something to to advance the school system forward. So I don't see this as a venue for for the for information stuff. I see this as we're working, we're making a decision to then bring to the full board or to move on to the next committee. If it's just for information, I mean, we 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 got feedback from um, community members saying that they don't really watch a lot of these committee meetings. And so if we really wanna bring something to the full public, then you bring it to the full board meeting um, because that's what gets the most views. The public, they don't always have time to watch all the different committee meetings we have just to get information. So if we really want to get at the intent, um, especially Ms. Dominowski, at what you're saying, that to be totally transparent, then let's put it on the board's agenda where we know everyone is going to watch it. And it follows that protocol already of this is where the information is shared. This is a working 
committee. That's the but, way, that's just how I view it. But it's, you know, whatever the, the committee decides. But logistically, we would not be able to have the depth of conversations that we've had in this committee over the past year in full board. So, I mean, I, I don't see how, I mean, we've gone over, we spent hours talking about things we would never, unless we're going to add more meetings to a, to the board schedule, I don't think we would get into that depth. So it would just become more cursory. And I mean, I just see that this is a place if people, if board members want more about curriculum, then you ask to be on the curriculum committee. And then if you're part of the public who wants to know more, then this is the place where you could listen and get more information. But uh, maybe you're envisioning doing the board meetings differently where we would be able to have the in-depth discussions that we're having here. Um, Ms. Pumphrey, did you have your hand up? Uh, mostly, I was going to say part of what you said and just also just a, I don't know if it's possible for us to add that in, you know, highlighted um, to see where we go with the rest of committees and what the full board thinks about as far as our vision for the future. Maybe we don't have to decide that here, that portion of it, but we can sort of discuss it in a in a fuller board meeting. So I think, you know, that what we already have as the purpose probably is would stand unless we're making radical changes to committees as far as only, I mean, because we have several committees that don't really have any work that's being produced. So I, I guess if we're going to change all of the committees and then that this one would change too. So I think we can stop this conversation until we bring it to the full board for more feedback. But Ms. Teleski, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I just think your your point about the detail of our conversations was a really good one that um, the depth of some of our understanding and some of our diving into some of the curriculum might just require more than what we currently have in terms of time with the board meeting. So that was a great point. Okay, thank you. Any other last comments on the purpose? Okay, and then the other piece was the measure of effectiveness. Um, we had talked about the a matrix or framework at our last meeting, and then we also, um, Mr. Minaski added two more ideas as far as reviewing assessment results um, or review collected feedback from students and educators. Um, and you can see the rest of it that's on the screen. Ms. Dominowski, did you want to talk at all to those two points? Uh, just, you know, some, but we do, a lot of times we do include them in the presentations as far as climate surveys and stuff like that. But um, if we could actually have the full results to review so that um, we could we could see exactly like just get more information that way as far as you know how this is actually working instead of just kind of like um, I'm, I'm not saying cherry picked in a negative way, but just like just to see a full picture of it instead of just a small portion of each survey, if we could get all the results and all the assessment results from all the schools. And so we can measure how well our, you know, where the curriculum committee, how well is our curriculum working? And maybe then that is also part of the matrix, what you're saying, that these are just more things that we'd want, that we might want to see in it. Other comments about the measures of effectiveness? Um, I know Ms. Booker Dwyer, you said that you had thought about some also. Yes, so it's just to, um, I just re, uh, made some tweaks to the language just to develop and apply that matrix or framework to decide which curriculum or curricular content. And I emailed this to you. you don't feel like you have to type oh, any of this okay. down um, okay. to, advance, to advance to the full board or another committee for consideration. So I just kind of tweaked the language a little bit Okay. Um, there, but I don't think we need many more than that. Like if we're if we have a clear framework that we're using that includes all the points that we want, then that's really to me the only measure of effectiveness that we need that we have actually developed it and we're using it and the public knows it. OK. OK, um, I didn't see the um, email earlier today, so I will look at I your language and kind of clean this up yeah. um, and then we can have the discussion with the full board. Um, next week, unless there's anything else anybody wants to add. Okay, 
All right, Ms. Cox, get ready. It's going to be your turn to share the screen, OK? OK. All right, so um, we have a number of um, other topics to discuss. I'm really going to watch the time because I know we have some that are going to require more discussion than others. So hopefully the first two um, will go um, a little bit quicker. But the first contract is the Equitable Services Tutoring Contract. And Dr. Wisted and Ms. Stansberry are ready unless Ms. Dr. DiDonato wants to start. Um, I just wanted to check, does everyone else see Mrs. Cox's computer screen? I still see yours, Ms. Lichter. I just wanted people to. Well, I stopped sharing mine, right? You shouldn't see mine now either, right? Correct. OK. Up. There we go. All right. I am going to turn this right over uh, to Ms. Stansberry. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know you had an opportunity to listen to the voiceover recording, so I'm actually going to just open up the floor for questions. Board members, any questions about the equitable service tutoring contract? Nope. OK. Um, so may Ms. Cox, may I, oh no, may I have a motion to approve the equitable services tutoring contract as presented? So moves Stolowski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, second Pumphrey. Okay, thank you. Ms. Cox, roll call vote, please. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next contract is the summer programs for students experiencing homelessness. And Dr. Wisted and Ms. Stansberry, Stansberry are ready with that one too. And thank you, Ms. Lichter. I will open up the floor for questions. Any questions? Okay. May I have a motion? Oops, Ms. Um, Booker Dwyer. I just had one question that I wasn't clear on. Is this a full day program or a half day program? It's full day. Okay. That was it. Okay. Um, may I have a motion to approve the summer programs for students experiencing homelessness contract? So move, so, Humphrey. Thank you. May I have a second? Is there a second? Second, Stolowski. Thank you. Ms. Cox, a roll call vote, please. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. I just want to just say one thing. If we went with the criteria we talked about with the purposes as far as the new, the this or that, those first two we wouldn't have had to bring to the curriculum committee. Just so a lot of these little ones are the ones that we would then not do. So I see you all shaking your head, meaning that makes sense to you. OK, um, the next contract is the two way translation communication contract. And for that, we have Miss Blotner ready to answer any questions. Is it Blotner or Blotner? Blotner, thank you. I need to use my phonetics, okay. Okay, no worries at all. Um, yes, again, this, the only thing that I'd like to highlight for you, I unfortunately weren't able to upload the recording because it was too large, so we'll just work internally to address that. But you need to know that this has been a tool that has really helped teachers work closely with our families to really communicate in two languages. And so it's been very helpful. As you know, we have over 12,968 multilingual learners. And so you can double that with their families. And so this has been very helpful. And I'll just open it up for questions. OK, thank you. Questions from board members? I just have one question. I saw from the graphs that um, it's been improving as far as usage, but how do we make sure that you know people know that this is out there and for teachers and administrators and families so at this point we've done a pilot in the district from january till the end of may and so since we've seen that tremendous growth happen we're anticipating that it will continue and you see the numbers have been going up we are also going to do training for school staff just to make sure that they understand especially for new staff that they know what's available and how to use it 
Okay, thank you. Anybody else? May I have a motion to approve the two-way translation communication contract? So, so move Stoleski. Thank you. May I have a second, please? Second. Domina, I'm not sure if you took Stoleski or me, but. <laughs> May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Cox? Sure. Um, Ms. Stoleski? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you to staff for those three PowerPoints. Even though we didn't ask a lot of questions, you gave us information that we needed um, in the slides. So thank you for that. So we moved quickly through those because the next couple ones are the ones we feel we may need more, more time with. So the next contract is the Orton-Gillingham um, contract and Ms. Myers and Dr. Kraft are here to answer any questions. And Dr. DiDonato, did you wanna start this one off? Sure. So, yes, um, as you know, the board approved a contract for um, Bowman's Orton Gillingham uh, about two years ago. Um, and through the Maryland Leeds grant, we had also started using and training using um, IMSE's Orton Gillingham Plus. So, this was to provide uh, an overview of both of the products um, because of the moving forward with an ISME contract also so that we can fully make uh, informed decisions about the services and supports that we're providing to our students um, who are in most need of significant reading um, intervention and support. Um, we did, uh, my Dr. Kraft and Ms. Myers did a wonderful job providing a voiceover PowerPoint prior to. Um, we did receive some questions, so if it's okay, we can start off um, responding to those questions to provide information and then see if there's other subsequent questions. Um, okay. Yeah, that's that sounds good. This contract is not coming this this week, next week, I mean, to the board, correct? No, I believe it's in June. Okay, right. I just want to, board, sometimes in the past, it's been very close. This one is not, and I appreciate that. So thank you. Um, okay, so we'll start. You have information to present first, correct? Based on the questions that we've received. Yep, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kraft and Ms. Myers. Uh, so one of the first <clears throat> questions we received was around the scope and sequence, uh, which um, we're happy to provide to you um, because I know you probably don't want me to list uh, the scope and sequence in totality um, in this moment, um, uh, going through every letter and um, blend. Um, but what I can tell you is the scope and sequences are different um, in the way that they present the materials. What I would also offer is that we always uh, we um, assess students. So um, we after we do a screener, we always do a diagnostic. Um, we use the beginning and advanced decoding survey so that we know specifically what students need. So while the the both vendors provide a scope and sequence, um, we still will assess and make sure that we are giving students what they need, meaning that if they've already mastered a concept, we're not going to then have them go through that sequence. And so while there is a scope and sequence, we always um, look at what student needs um, are to proceed um, forward. So we are happy to follow up with the exact scope and sequence. We have it in a chart for you um, so that you can see exactly the similarities and differences. Um, the oh, the next question um, Ms. Myers um, is going to talk about is uh, when did we start training or certifying our teachers in IMSE Comprehensive OG Plus? Yeah, so hi everyone, nice to see you. So um, as part of, and Dr. DiDonato referenced this in um, the kind of opening, is that as part of Maryland Leeds Grant, Baltimore County applied for um, funding under the strategy for science of reading. Um, as part of those grant funds, we had to implement training for K-3 teachers, including special ed teachers, principals, and other staff. Um, that's through a train the train model and through direct training. So um, in order to ensure that um, we had to submit a plan for sustainability after the grant period ends. So difference being that we need to be able to indicate how we are training in this, but then we're able to continue with that um, after um, the grant is, is over. So what what is a, a look for is the opportunity to have a trainer in the system. Um, our Orton Gillingham training, we selected the vendor from Maryland Leeds, which was this um, IMSE 
um, comprehensive OG plus um, because it had the district certification program so that we are able to have um, professional learning for teacher who would then be able to support as a district trainer in in the content. Um, and there's only this was um, only one of the programs that really offered that. So that was really where that started. Um, in May 2023, several central office staff completed the training, and then June 2023, um, we began um, we began training the teachers. Um, this is the the train. We say train the trainer, which we know is not the best term for that, but really having a district certified trainer is a critical piece because. Um, that is something that um, when we when we compare the two programs, which is you know really what the purpose of this um, slideshow was to do, is that the Bowman um, system doesn't allow for that. So you have to use their trainers for every aspect of the training, um, where where the IMSC does allow us to have that district level um, trainer who also is in the coach. So the goal would then be that that person is able to provide on the spot feedback as well as training. It also um, honestly is like a reduced cost once we have that trainer as far as sustainability within the system. Um, so I'll also take the next one, which was um, asking about how many teachers we have currently certified in IMSE. Currently, we have, um, and I apologize, I'm going to read this part because it's just specific numbers. So we have 139 um, teachers trained through IMSE, and another 39 teachers um, are in the process that will be completed before the start of the school year. 54 of those IMSE trained OG teachers have also completed letters, which is, um, uh, it provides additional 60 to 90 hours of intensive training aligned to the science of reading. Um, and letters we've talked about before as part as one of those evidence-based um, professional development designed to help teachers master the content and principles of that effective language of literacy. Um, so that's the letters in addition. We have 328 teachers trained in Bowman OG plus at the elementary level and 47 at the secondary level. So the Bowman system we've had around for longer and we do have um, more teachers currently trained trained in that. Um, the, the next question asked about the IMSE trained teachers um, considered, are they considered certified after completing the 30 hours of synchronous training? Or do they also need to complete the 12 and a half hours of phonological awareness? And then a question about how we're keeping track. So teachers are considered trained after completing the 30 hours. Um, there's also coursework that must be completed in addition to the 30 direct um, professional learning hours. Um, so in that course, it's very intense 30 hours um, and within it, there are assignments and things that are done by the by the staff being trained to ensure that um, they, they teach to mastery with the content. Um, BCPS has made a commitment to providing, of course, the phonological awareness training as part of the OG training if we move forward with IMSC. So there's an additional phonological training that um, we would that we are committing to as far as to ensure that, um, you know, our goal is to ensure that those folks that are with our students that have this significant need are the most trained. So we're we would be um, committing to adding that to it. Um, and then as far as the tracking system, um, that's an easy tracking as far as having a sense of we know who's been trained and then who um, has has the additional trainings, which is why uh, I was kind of being able to speak to that that question now. Jen, you want to take the next one? Yeah, so the question was, is IMSC a tier three specific intervention? Does IMSC provide, recommend, and or require additional training or supports for tier three specific interventions? And so, um, so the simple answer is no, it's not specific to tier three, um, because when we think about a multi-tiered system of support, it's, it's a framework um, that emphasizes personalized assistance for students. So it design, it's really designed to offer a spectrum of supports um, based on what students need. It provides this systematic structure and approach that is flexible in nature. And so what we wanna remember is that a program or a vendor or a curriculum is not a tier. What makes something a more intense tier, so as you move from tier one, which is core, um, to tier two, which is strategic, to tier three, which is intensive, of uh, what we're really thinking about is multiple things that make it more intense, which is not necessarily the product. And so we really want to make sure that we are looking at the individuality of each learner and what they need. And so 
um, IMSC offers um, tier one, two, and three. Um, but if you are using it as a tier three, they recommend taking the course that is specifically called um, IMSC Intervention and Support for Struggling Readers. Um, one of the ways that we can also increase the intensity of delivery is pro by providing the um where the intervention is provided by a more highly trained staff. That could mean a reading specialist, a teacher who has taken letters, a series structured literacy, classroom teacher certification, series structured literacy, dyslexia interventionist cert certification, and or series structured literacy dyslexia specialist certification. And so there's there's no there should be no program that we say this is a tiered approach, but rather that we really look at what makes something more um, intense for a student. And so uh, we really want to just make sure that we're distinguishing out those things. Um, and really, when we look at the National Center for Intensive Interventions, they really talk about these seven domains, which includes the strength of the intervention program, the dosage of supports, um, alignment to targeted skills and standards, attention to transfer, comprehensiveness, and behavioral support, which behavioral support also encompasses executive functioning. Um, and so that really, um, in a nutshell, I could talk more, but in a nutshell is um, why we're not going to call a program a tier three, but really talk about the delivery of a program or a vendor and how it meets a tier three criteria. Um, is the next one me too, Ms. Myers? Yes. Okay. Um, Miss um, Craft, Dr. Craft, why don't we pause for a sec? Yes, of course. It's a, bit, it's a lot of information and see if we have any <laughs> questions on the responses we just had, and then of we will course. go to the next chunk. So Ms. Domenowski? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm just a little confused because I feel like the Bowman OG is specifically a tier three intervention. And if the MS, E, I'm sorry if I'm not saying it right. Um, IMSE. The other one. IMSE is not specific. I mean, you have, I mean, it is, it can be, but the, and you take, like, with the Bowman AG, um, Bowman's um, OG, you take 60 hours uh, and you become certified in that. And it doesn't sound, I mean, you said trained, you didn't say certified in the, um, in the MSE. Am I saying it again wrong? MSE, yeah, MS. <laughs> Forgetting a letter. Just call it the M other one. I M S E, the <laughs> other one. Um, there's the 30 hours. Are they trained or are they certified? And I'm just um I'm worried because we have these 300 and you know 40 28 Bowman certified teachers in OG. I'm they're specifically for that, you know, that tier three mm -hmm. intervention, which I'm sorry, my I mean I'm like it saved my son. So, I mean, he can read now because of that. And it is a tedious process and it's something that you sit down and you have to, you know, do it over and it's slow and it's a slow process in the beginning, but it works and we know that it works. And um, it's proven with our, our dyslexic children. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of the only dyslexic um, children, like got geared towards dyslexic children. And I'm very concerned about, um, this one, you need that extra training for that tier three intervention. So are we, would this get rid of Bowman's, um, will we, if, if if we decided to go with this, are we getting rid of the Bowman's OG? Well, I, our yeah. ultimate goal is to look at both products, fully evaluate all components that they have and make a decision for one. We already have a, a contract with Bowman, so that that isn't going away. I, I think we still have three years left on it. Um, but our goal is to have a single product that we're using to serve kids. The goal is to have less kids who need intervention, but we know we're going to always have students who do. So for students who do, no matter what their teachers are trained in, they're trained repeatedly in an ongoing way and provided with coaching and support so that they can continue to grow. Because no matter what training you take, a one-time training is never enough. You need coaching, you need refreshers, you need an administrator who can give you feedback on it. So there's all these other pieces that are also critical for a teacher because if a teacher's trained in Norton Gillingham and then does not use it for two years, whether they were trained with IMSE or Bowman's, I would want them to go through a refresher course of some type before they just started working with children. Um, 
because I want to make sure that they have that level of specificity and skill when they're working with kids. So our goal is to have a single one um, and to really fully evaluate, which is why we're going through this process, um, to really evaluate, get feedback, and you know, to then make a, a recommendation to the board for a contract or to Can not. Dr. Donato, can I add um, just a, a little bit to that? Is I, I um, Ms. Dominowski, I want to kind of address your like tier, the tier one versus tier three um, as well. So, so IMSC is in OG is used in some districts as their tier one. In Baltimore County, we use Open Core as far as our tier one, as far as our core instruction. So that it, it can be, and it could be used for all students. What takes it to when you think about that intensity and the duration of the sessions, but the, that intensity of kind of the dosage, which I know you've heard Dr. Kraft talk about in the past when we've speak, spoken about intervention, that's where you get into the, the intensity of the amount of time or of maybe the group setting or how it's being delivered is what makes it then that two or three. Orton Gillingham itself is a um, is a modality of teaching students to read and I'm not saying that in the best way right but like that that is a structure whether or not it is done through the Bowman scope and sequence letters in order component or we're looking at the IMSC which the way that they're doing their scope and sequence and their letters and sounds in order the Orton Gillingham and the OG methodology is OG methodology that OG methodology is what when you reference about being able to meet the needs of your son and you seeing that growth, that's that's that uh, that methodology, regardless of the the vendor that that is around it. As far as the training itself, I think the part that I want to highlight is the importance of trainings can look a lot of different ways. Um, and and one of the things in, in my answer was that I, I referenced that within that 30 hours is kind of the intensity of the training. So it is all based on um, the that OG modality, making sure that that instructor is seeing how the um, those taking the course are responding. There's assignments throughout to ensure that there's mastery of the content. Um, although the 60 hour component, there is some of that. Um, there's also some podcast examples and, and we went through this as far as in the PowerPoint, but there's some other aspects of the training that aren't as direct. So um, and I think it's important to, to think about just like with anything that we do, for teachers and for students, right, is that intensity um, and consistency of that of what we're doing when we're training or when we're teaching, and that and that does make a difference. So I just kind of wanted to hit on all, all all the little aspects of what you asked, and then I know I'm, I'm hoping as we get through the rest of this, we'll be able to um to to answer further questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll let somebody else ask. I don't want to hog any more of your time, Miss Pumphrey. You talked about the importance of the delivery of instruction, and um, you also talked about um, for the tier three, the recommendation that the tier three um, instructors are have um, more intense um, training and um, certification. So my my question about that is currently our educators who are teaching our tier three students, do they have that additional training certification? So that's one way that we increase intensity, and I would say that I can't speak to all of our um, current instructors. Um, what I was able to do was, um, because the question was specifically around IMSC that we had gotten ahead of time, so I was able to say, okay, we have 139 teachers that have already completed training, and then 54 of those did have that additional um, 60 to 90 hours of letters. Um, but I that doesn't include are some of them also trained reading specialists, et cetera. Um, and so then, uh, you know, additionally, um, I'm I'm curious when you when we talk about um, when you finish the 60 hours of Bowman, you're you're certified. Is that series certified? Um, what certification are they getting after that 60 hours? I'm actually talking about the um, IMSC, the um you, I, I thought that you mentioned, maybe I misunderstood. I thought that you mentioned, you said the 139 trained through IMSC, but that 139 is just with the 30 hours. That's not with the recommended additional training for specifically for recommended for tier three. Am I correct about that? They You're have the 30, they have the, the original 30 um, hours to implement OG and then 
at this point, because I, I haven't had enough time to dig in to see also who has a reading specialist on those things, I was able to quickly, because we have been collecting letters data, um, find out that 54 of those 139 have the additional letters training. I would then have to go back and look and see what other certifications they have. Um, so, you know, I, I did the digging that I could, you know, in, in the time I can still continue to do, you know, some of that digging. No, and I appreciate that. I, I'm not really looking for specifics. I'm just trying to determine um, based on the recommendation for, for, for fidelity that I've that I'm seeing. It was brought to my attention. This isn't something that I, I'm, you know, it was brought to my attention. Um, yeah. That that the the program itself recommends additional certification at the mm -hmm. tier three level. So does does that fifty four um, teachers uh, yes. the additional yes. letters training? Does that is that, that is that is that fit that um, yes. training for fidelity for that higher That's level correct. that tier three level? Okay. Yes. And then Ms. Pum Ms. Pumphrey, oh. to, your, to the point of your question, the other part about, it, because I, the part that we said would be the additional part that we are committing to is the additional 12.5 hours of phonological awareness training, that, that we don't have that data right at this moment. That wasn't something that we had gathered from the system, but it is something that we can get back to look at the number of the 139. We know that 54 of them have the extra letter training. We can also look at the um, number of them who already have the phonological awareness training. And if they don't, that is a next step for them that we've already identified. I think that was my main question. If if your right. answer, I don't, I'm not looking for specifics. I guess the, I, the, my question more is um, towards what is the plan for, um, for, ed for, ed for educators that do not have that additional recommended certification at the, you know, to teach our, to teach our tier three students. It's that they will complete the training and we're going to identify timeframes for them to complete the various trainings. We've also had discussions as far as just some of the expectations, even before people get into certain roles, yes. that we're going to make some shifts with regarding the expectation of certain levels of training already being completed. While some of them aren't required to become a reading specialist or to become a resource teacher, um, we're going to create some additional parameters around that so that we are not... Um, going behind people who are in roles to make sure they have the extra training, but we're trying to get out in front of it. OK, thank you. And, um, I think, and I do appreciate, I just want to say, I do appreciate having this in advance so that we can really, you know, before we have to vote on the contract, so that we really um, can have these questions answered and to think about it more. Um, because, you know, some of these contracts, some of these came before us right before we had to make a decision. So I appreciate mm -hmm. the um, time frame that this was presented. Um, I have some questions, but I'm going to let you finish some of your answers to the other questions, and then I'll ask mine. So, um, Dr. Kraft or Ms. Myers, um, I cut you off, so I'm letting yeah, you go. Yeah, no, no, it was good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, so, the next question was: Is IMSC targeted for students with dyslexia? Does IMSC provide training for teachers to recognize students with dyslexia? So, IMSC is an IDA accredited partner program with both the comprehensive OG plus and the morphology plus trainings. Um, they're also um, have an accredited plus program and accredited through the Center for Effective Reading Instruction as an improved pathway towards the series structured literacy dyslexia specialist or interventionist certificates. The OG trainings for comprehensive and morphology include allocated time for providing the definition of dyslexia, mis misconceptions about dyslexia, explaining how the brain of those with dyslexia works, and walking through the possible signs of dyslexia. Additionally, they have a, 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 a separate standalone course in addition to providing that throughout the training um, on dyslexia. There were a couple of questions related to um, students with IEPs currently using Bowman's OG um, in comparison to IMSC. And, and with that, I'm going to go back to kind of my same statement to, to start this is around that talking about the need for Orton-Gillingham um, as a methodology um, or and a lot of times might be described as like a multisensory approach to teaching um, reading instruction. So um, the question specifically asked about whether or not we would be reevaluating the hours on an IEP um, to reflect the differences between the two programs. And to that, as we all know, an IEP is an individualized education um, program. So um, that's individualized to the student. So, you know, while there are recommendations from vendors as far as um, the the amount of time that might be um, recommended for for their product, what we know is best practice for students is to ensure that 
we know what the students needs are and take into multi data multiple data points with determining maybe how that session might look. So it might have a student that may need um, a smaller chunk of an intervention ba based on their um, ability to be able to maintain attention or maybe some that are split into a couple of um, of blocks of time. Um, so it, that that really has to be um, an IEP team decision. So we wouldn't be saying that um, as we shouldn't say that um, we would be revising IEPs based on a product. Um, it really is based on um, what the specific needs of the student and how they're then being able to have that specially designed instruction in order to meet their to meet those needs. Um, I think there were two kind of questions that that went around that. So I'm, I'm hoping that was able to um, to answer both of those. Uh, well, just like just to follow up with that, as far as like, will the will the teams be notified of the change so that they can decide whether or not any modifications need to be made? Yeah, so so um, to talk about kind of the IEP process a little bit about that, so that is that it as we know that we meet every year based on a student that's required right to review an IEP within every year or based on progress for a student. So if a student's not making progress, you return to team. Um, the team would not we would not recommend IEP teams coming to team because there was a change in a in a product or a change in we want to be going we would want to be returning to um, an IEP team based on a student's progress or based on um, like I said, the normal, like the annual review process or the time for reevaluation planning, et cetera. So, so no, there would not be guidance that we would um, have a new product and return to team because there's a new product. Um, it would based, be based on um, student progress and then the, the normal kind of regulations around when you hold an IEP team meeting. Well, when it comes to the, this specific IEP and like a tier three intervention, this product is kind of like a prescription and the prescription changes the dosage changes. So I feel like this might be some area where the teams, especially parents and, um, you know, parent educators, anyone like they need to be informed that this is going to change. Uh, I just, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I feel totally like that'd be kind of misleading to not tell our, tell yeah. our parents <laughs> and students what was going on. Yeah. And just to clarify, so, so obviously there's communication when we're mm -hmm. um, having conversations about Communication regarding a vendor and conversation about and communication regarding um, products is one thing that we would not be informing, and I may have misunderstood your question, but we would not be um, providing guidance or informing IEP teams that they need to meet to reflect the change of a vendor. That's separate. So we would be obviously notifying that, you know, um, that it's it's public information and we'll be sharing if we were um, shifting whichever model we go through with regards to training, et cetera. But we'll but we wouldn't be telling IEP teams to be held in order to reflect that. So not necessarily like would they be you, I know it's public, but would they be directly informed? Would they get sent home a letter, say, listen, your curriculum, your product is changing. And so whether that they they can make the decision on their own that to call a meeting if they wanted to or ask for a meeting or is it just going to be like you know public information and if you find it you find it do you but Mr. Manowski, the products but the methodology is not if on the IEP right. it says that they need to meet they get four times a week OG services that would still need to happen regardless of but the, the vendor but the, but the training and everything is different for OG for the IMSE the recommendation for you know a tier three intervention is different than that it is for Bowman it's a it's a totally different scope and sequence everything I mean I, I just I I'm not saying we have to tell them that they have to change what they're doing but they should be informed that we're switching to a different product and this product Scope and sequence is different. Um, I mean, they should like when I had my first meeting, I was told that this is what we're using and this is how it works. So now we're changing it without telling and, them. But, and but I think we're, we're getting out of the methodology. And I think that's I think that's the challenge. So it's it's Orton Gillingham is a methodology. There's lots of vendors that provides training. IMSE provides training or in Gillingham Academy provides training. They have their own levels of certification there. Bowman provides is another vendor that provides training for the Orton Gillingham methodology. And I think that is, you know, at the core of it, it's a methodology and we're going to provide students with what they need. If a student is making progress, receiving Orton Gillingham and would the Orton Gillingham methodology However, our person was trained, it, they might have been trained through Orton Gillingham 
academy. And we would still validate that they're a trained Orton Gillingham uh, a practitioner. Um, you know, again, we're going to look at if kids are making pro if kids aren't making progress, we are going to intervene. It, it is. So it's 100%. a reactionary. So if they start the, going down, then we'll go in and change it. I'm just saying, I'm not saying, all I'm saying is, I, I, like, just one question. Will we be notifying the parents, the students, the IE team, just that the product is changing, that we're no longer using this? Will they be notified directly, or will it just be, you know, a mass public information? There would be no change in, in the day-to-day -day structure for a student. So there would be no communication with the student or the parent that their product is changing. Yeah, we're is... getting off of the topic as I was trying right. to get that in before. So we can we haven't even made a decision about which vendor to right. use. So I think we're getting way, way ahead of ourselves and come back to the, the vendor piece. But but I think we have to remember we're talking about a methodology, not a product. Um, my questions were going to be around the teacher quality pieces when they're actually teaching the program. And you had shown one of the slides that you had in there showed a template for um, template for ICE, the other one, and then just a list kind of for Orton Gillingham. Which one has more specific um, lesson plans for teachers like on a daily basis? So what I've heard from teachers, some of the teachers that have done both, um, you know, I've talked to a few of them um, and uh, they have told me they feel like they have more resources with the um, IMSE um, in terms of being able to plan. And of course, you know, I don't I don't even want to use the word template because really you're you're planning for the group of students sitting in front of you. But what they feel like is that the materials are very accessible and flexible and that they have ways to go back and reteach in different ways because there's multiple um, materials available. Um, the, 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 they take different approaches um, in terms of um, with with Bowman, it is um, every day or every day that they're getting the instruction. It's a very it's a set routine, um, whereas um, with IMSE, uh, what you'll see is that they will um, they will say like on, you know, maybe Monday and Wednesday, you're doing these things and Tuesday and Thursday. And there's some things that are every day. And so within that, um, they have an online component where they can go and draw additional resources um, to use for for instruction, which is really helpful when our students get stuck. Um, sometimes there's not multiple pathways. Um, and so we end up, um, because you're teaching to mastery, um, you know, you get stuck sometimes with, with a certain letter sound. Um, and so what I'm hearing from teachers, because I'm, of course, not teaching it myself, um, but what I'm hearing from teachers is that they're finding more ways um, with it within IMSC to teach in different ways when a student isn't getting it um, when they are first first exposed or after multiple exposures. OK, thank you. And then the other piece was the professional development slides. Um, so if I let me see my notes, I think those were. After this. Yeah, the, the rubric about the professional um, development. Right, so. Where is it? No, it's not. I don't remember, but. There was a lot of the rubric for both of them came out kind of even until you got to the professional development piece and the sustainability one. Um, so I just think the fact that I just want to make sure Bowman does not have um, a refresher course. Um, yeah, Ms. Cox, can you go one more slide forward, I think? Yeah, that um, one. Yeah, so. Um, so we actually had a chance to meet with both vendors and you know we uh, appreciated the time from both vendors and meeting with us and an answering all of our questions they spent multiple hours with us walking through um their their product and so we had some very specific questions and and a lot of them became really from Marilyn Leeds and asking about sustainability which is a very fair question when we do get grant money when that money finishes what how is the school district is it just going to stop and fade away or is the school district going to be able to continue to sustain it and so one of the things that um um that 
uh, IMSC offers is a refresher course. So if, for example, and we have this happen sometimes, a teacher teaches OG, then for two years they don't teach it. For whatever reason, their teaching schedule changes, and then they come back to teach it again. Because it is a, a very... Um, uh, enriched model to help students learn, um, those refresher courses allow you to pick up those uh, different ways of delivering the OG methodology. Um, and so that was um, a, a, an advantage. Um, and so when we talked to um, Bowman OG plus vendor, um, they said that they would take it to take the, the course over. Um, and so and so we clarified to say the 60 hour course. And so they say they said, yes, the 60 our course. Um, but the other thing that was really interesting, and I do want to make sure that when we say there was a course for paraeducators, the paraeducators, of course, would never be the ones delivering the instruction. But as we know, um, as our students are in classes all day in core classes, what's nice is paraeducators can have an 18 hour training. So some of those same methodologies that the instructor is using during direct OG instruction, the paraeducator can continue over with the student throughout the day as they are approaching their other work. And so that's another way that we can really continue to invest in our paraeducators and give some consistency to students across the school day using the same language and the same methods. OK, thank you. Um, I just think it's really important that because often in the past we haven't had a sustainability plan for things and then it's just gone downhill <laughs> because we didn't put it in place. Go ahead, out, Ms. Myers. I, I, I'd like to add also um, that I think that, that that top one there, the time about the administrative support, that stood out to me as in evaluating both programs is that we know um, our teachers need feedback, they need coaching, we need to ensure that things are being um, implemented the way they need to. And Bowman has a, you know, they, they talk about it very minimally as far as what the administrator would have as far as an understanding of um of that methodology of og where um imsc has an actual course that we could be using with administrators which is critical right like that's ensuring that things are being implemented um i'll i'll give myself as an example going from um, a secondary assistant principal to central office and then to be an elementary principal um when i walked in i needed i need i i needed something to be able to really train me around what what it is that i'm looking for to be able to give my teachers feedback etc and um that would have been great and that that wasn't a thing so i think you know that's a critical piece for that when we think about for feedback and sustainability and ensuring that our teachers are implementing what they need to be implementing um so that we're seeing consistent progress patterns with our kids um and that you know that's that's really important um so i just wanted to highlight that as well okay thank you um i just had questions specific to the rubric go ahead um how who determined the rubric for this so cni is responsible for any evaluation of materials to create a rubric that's used with those materials so just like we create a rubric for the evaluation of um the secondary ELA and ELD materials, the same thing was done um, with this. So did did you take both the, the Bowman training and the IMSE training when you did the rubric? Like when you like who who filled out, like who answered the rubric, I guess, or did. So it, go ahead, Dr. Kraft. Um, <clears throat> so just um to to stay with dr d donato's example so when we just evaluated the three or multiple uh, products for secondary ela we hadn't taught any of them but what instead we have criteria to look at to see if it meets the needs looking through the not only the materials provided but also um actually directly interacting with the vendors and so uh we have multiple people fill multiple stakeholders you know fill it out and looking at the the different products and so um, we had, um, so I, so in, in determining the rubric, we actually worked with, um, uh, an independent, somebody that was trained by letters and talked a little bit also about like, what are we looking for in a program in addition to what we already know about Orton G uh, Gillingham methodology and what we're looking for and what it looks like for sustainability. So we took um, several pieces um, of information um, to create and evaluate um, the program so that we could move forward in a way that we can sustain throughout, um, not just this year, but as we look at our three and five year plan for our students. 
So did it include any of our own teachers that have been through both trainings or either of the trainings? So staff within our department in um, the Depar my department, Department of Special Education have been both through both of them were part of being able to give that feedback within that. So yes. So I, I mean, I, just how many people like can you? Like, do we have I mean, are we allowed to name or like what like who was a part of? So I think I'm um, trying to trying to put a weight the to number the of people I we can find I can. Right, we can look we, up and, the number and, of people on and, the evaluation and, committee and let you know the number. Right, I think we are trying not to name people because I think that some people, especially those that were trained in both, like I think that we're just part part of the process was, you know, also not making people feel uncomfortable about, you know, like one way or the other, but just what their lived experience was. So we can certainly go back and look and get that back to you. It just, it just like, I, I don't need to know anybody's name. I just meant like numbers wise. These are the actual classroom teachers that were fully trained or certified in Bowman and, and IMSE and these are the uh, like the central office people like this th this number of central office from special education this number from CNI what like it doesn't have to I don't need names just I would just like to see the the actual numbers of you know, people sure people yep yeah. and the breakdown of you know what department and where they were from that would be great thank you Ms. Booker Dwyer I just have a follow-up to Ms. Domanowski questions what what would that information inform because I just know we're at a point in time in the school year where, you know, there's a lot happening and we keep asking staff to pull what seems to be random information. And I'm just wondering how is that informing a decision that we're making? Is this just nice to know or are we actually using this information to do something with? I'm using it to make a decision of whether to move forward with a brand new curriculum or to keep something that we know has already been working. And it would be helpful to know who was involved in this rubric. Otherwise, I mean, you could basically, I, it would be helpful so, to know who was involved in that. So to, if, it, if we're going to use this rubric as a way to make a decision, we should know who was involved in making it. But and a lot so of the rubric is not about the content of the actual trainings. It's about the whole vendor's package. Yeah. So the slide we're looking on has nothing to do with the content of those trainings. It has to do with what they offer for professional yep. development. You're on mute, Ms. Domenowski. Ms. Domenowski, you're on mute. I'm sorry, Ms. Domenowski, you're on mute. I'm sorry. I was just, I was just saying, if if you're saying that it's not part of the training, this rubric, then why do we have the rubric at all? It, no, I'm not I, saying just, that. I'm saying a lot of the items on here, if you read it, they're about the whole package that the vendor is providing, not necessarily about. Right, but our teachers are the ones that are going to be teaching it, so they should be in. I mean, I, I assume they'd be able to answer some of these questions, right? So I mean, they have to look at the um, rest of the rubric. Since they're the ones that are going to be, you know, in direct contact with our students and, and working this. And I, I just, I'm, this is our most vulnerable part of our, you know, our, our, our school. Like it's our tier three kids are ones that, you know, need the most help. So it's just, I'm, I'm just asking for, I, I don't, I don't see why that is a hard thing to look up as far as, as far as, you know, just, you don't, who was involved in doing it. OK, so we um, have two more topics. This um, the, uh, this presentation is not up for vote um, soon, so we can continue this conversation and move on to the next two, if that's what. Um, no, I, I had a couple of questions that weren't answered as far as um, the Bowman not having any materials or the they didn't have anything where to go the resources they didn't submit any resources did they give you a reason or you know was when when were they asked to submit anything so that's so, part of the RFI process so it says submit resource so that was when the bid was their contract was originally out um so that isn't something we didn't ask for that now so is that kind of misleading to say that they didn't submit any when they weren't really asked again. Um, so, so what I'll, I go ahead, Jen. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, in addition to typically, in general, 
um, during an RFI process, um, you know, we ask about, you know, research that they have. So typically, I would say almost every RFI that I see um, evaluating, and I've done quite a few since I've been here, include research. But then when they had an opportunity to meet with us, um, we, you know, they were allowed to also bring research at that time. That was, you know, that was one of the things they could because we asked about the efficacy of their product. So no, we didn't say you have to provide research, um, but we did say what um, efficacy do you have, you know, of your product. So um, I, you know, we typically don't make, when an RFI is turned in, actually, um, everything goes through procurement. We don't actually interact directly with vendors um, until we get further along in the process. So, um, but Ms. Myers, go ahead and add in. Sorry. Nope, nope. You you nailed it. I just wanted to clarify that. And, and the reason we met back with folks was because we wanted to be able to have like the most up-to-date information from them um, and that they had submitted through the RFA process a few years back. So, um, and when we had those very, um, you know, extensive conversations around what their products are, like, you know, Dr. Kraft reference as far as, you know, what they're bringing to the table, what are their training models, um, if they have any, you know, we, we discussed why their scope and sequences look the way they do, et cetera, et cetera. There wasn't um, any research presented at that time. The, and then the the research that you submitted for the IMSE, three of them were K through three grades, and they were only small portions of the that testing group that were, um, you know, IEPs or struggling students and um, uh, low income families. And then the one that did include all, you know, the tier three level students was the. Um, the the data project report which had and it, it said it, it included the extra 45 minute sessions for um the small it said it instructed multiple times per week in a 45 minute one-on-one -on -one or small group so is that the way that this is going to be and like that was pretty but that was the only one that was specific to tier three um so what I can tell you is that um, there is a, a more dated one they know specifically did do special education students. Um, and uh, I didn't include it because it, it was a little more dated. It was the Pontiac study. Um, and they did look at special education students in grades three, four, and five. Um, and what they found is that they ended the year with mean test scores equivalent to their peers in general education, despite having begun the year with um, lower test scores. I certainly can also, um, if you are interested interested in additional research beyond what's on their website, I certainly can go back and ask them <laughs> if they have specifics. And I will just add one more time that we're not, we're not going to, um, a, a vendor who doesn't know our students are, isn't going to necessarily dictate how we implement OG regardless of the vendor we go with. We are going to, in a team that knows the student best, um, is going to make a decision based on data that has been collected, multiple data points collected over time, to make an informed decision about what a student needs. And so, um, you know, we're not going to lock into any one thing because that would defeat the purpose of an individualized education plan or really looking at student needs. Okay. Could you also go back and ask? Bowman okay, Mr. Winaski, we need to stop the conversation would... right now because we have two other um, other staff that have gotten ready to present, and Ms. Booker Dwyer has had her hand up for a while. Um, we're going to need to bring this back to another curriculum committee meeting. So, if there's still additional questions, we can um, we'll work on getting those answers in that presentation. Ms. Booker Dwyer, did you have another comment or question about? No, this? I. Just put it in the chat because I feel like this is an a, a example of why we need to collectively decide as a group what is the information that we need to inform our governance decisions. We can keep asking question after question after question. We just need to understand collectively how the entire group, what are the key things that we need to know to move something forward? If not, we're just going to keep down this rabbit hole that I'm not sure has a, a clear ending. So um, that's just what I, that's my bigger question here, because it feels like we're getting so into the weeds that I just, I don't, I, I, I've lost, I've lost the point of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we're also losing the idea that this is um that it's an OG, both are OG, um, both methods. I mean, it's not two different methods. It's one method and two different vendors in the way that it's it's packaged. So a lot of the information on this rubric was helpful for me as I looked at in a bigger sense 
What is the professional development that's being offered? What are the resources for teachers being offered? Um, as well as the training um, in the beginning. But we will um, continue, we will add this again, but um, Ms. Booker Dwyer, your question is a much bigger, um, much bigger one. Um, the next, that one did not need a vote or anything, so we can move on to the um, grade 11, 12 health update. Um, and for that, we have Ms. Roller and Ms. Shea. Dr. DiDonato, did you want to start this one? So I'm going to turn it right over uh, to uh, Dr. Shea and Ms. Roller so they can get started. But this was truly, um, Ms. Booker Dwyer, your question earlier, this is really an update about um, health curriculum updates based on um, change in legislation. And thank you for the very um, detailed PowerPoint. It did go through a lot of the why, the what, the how. So um, I did appreciate that as far as preparing. Thank you. Were there any questions about Health 1112? <laughs> any questions from any board members? All okay. right, let's move on to grade seven. Right? Okay, <laughs> grade seven. I was trying to give wait time. Um, are there questions about the grade seven update curricular materials regarding sexuality? I just had one. Yes, Ms. Dominowski. So it was under executive co um, content, so public can't see those presentations. So I'm not sure how we can inform. Like, so we are, um, Megan is working right now to get our resources on for public comment. OK. That's yep, all. So that's parents new. are always welcome to come in before any sexual health unit is taught to see the resources that their child will be participating in so they can make an informed choice about opt out. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I've been in, in those meetings and I just know it's not an easy thing for every parent to do to get if it, we were able to put as much as we can online available to them to get to it. And not even every parent is available is able to get online, but it's at least um, easier than driving to the school and sitting down and making an appointment with the teacher. So that's all I was trying to. And I, I know it's available. I know you can do that. Um, but if we could also make it available that way, it would be great. Thank you. Any other questions from board members about the grade seven update? OK, so um, we do still have eight minutes left in our time. Ms. Booker Dwyer, would you like to go back and discuss more of the question that you've put in the chat? Or is that something for a bigger group for the? I think it's for the bigger discussion uh, okay. because I'm just wondering, like, what is it as a whole are we with? What is the information that we need to be provided to make that decision? So that way the team can come prepared. It's packaged in a way that we need it to be packaged. The information is there. Um, because it, I, I just get concerned if there's outside groups trying to influence something with the board. And so I'm just wondering if as a board, could we come together to say, this is what we've all agreed on to say, this is gonna to help to inform our decisions. And then could we at least start there? And then as other questions may come up as we have, but at least do we have just that baseline to start with? Because I just feel like every meeting, it just, we spiral down all these very specific questions that it's just like, okay, let's come out of operation. And if our role is governance, what do we need to know to inform our governance decision? That's all I um, that that's all I um, am getting at, and that gets at what we were talking about with the purpose and the measures of effectiveness. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Pumphrey. I just wanted to speak to um, uh, Ms. Booker Dwyer's comment about um, outside groups. I think we do get questions from outside groups, and I think as a board member, at least when I get mess when I get questions from outside groups, um, I look at look at it more as things be items being brought to my attention that I may not have thought of initially. Um, and when I think that they are concerning to me, I do ask questions about that. I do try to stay out of the weeds, which is why I tried to format my questions um, more to the professional development level, because I know that um, OG is a methodology, but the program that we're looking at is about professional is about our teacher um, training. Um, so, and yes, sometimes we do get questions from groups, but I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually helps us to inform our decisions by asking questions that we may not have thought of initially on our own. 
Thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Yeah, I just wanted to um, follow up on Ms. Humphrey said, um, I agree. I'm not a teacher. I don't come from a teaching background, so I rely a lot on, you know, outside sources of people that are teachers that are special educators that um, especially with having a son that's in, you know, going through an IEP and has special education. So, yes, I do listen to other people and, and I, I do take their suggestions and questions into mind. And um, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think that's part of, you know, including our community and what's going on here. I can't just sit back and I understand that you're presenting us with what you think is the best and you've vetted it and you've gone through everything. But our job isn't just to sit here and check a box and say, OK, they did their work and we're done. Like that's part of our job is is to ask those questions and to make sure so that we make the best decisions um, that I, you know, we feel comfortable with for not just, you know, one group of students, but for all groups of students. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer, did you have your hand up again? No, yes, and I agree. I do think it is important to listen to what the community is saying. Um, I also think it's important that as a board that that we have collectively identified what it is. We, we've, you know, we're going through this process of whether what, what is our moral imperative? What are the priorities? All of these things. And so that all I'm saying is, do we at least have a baseline, some type of foundation that we can keep coming to the table with to say at a bare minimum, we know we need this information. And this is what the collective board, everyone has agreed on. We can add to that. We can build on that. But could we at least start there? Because it just feels like um, it, it's all it feels a bit all over the place sometimes. And so what is it? And then we can be transparent with the public to say, all right, th these are this is what we're looking for. And if there's anything else, let us know. We can include that. But, you know, when a presentation has been developed and then it just it just feels like it, we could proactively address this in the presentation if the team knows what exactly it is that we want to see to inform a decision. That's all I'm saying so that this so that we can be proactive here. And it will be helpful, I think, to the public so that they know what's the criteria that we are looking at. And then they could let us know, nope, your criteria is faulty, or we want to also see this or, or other things. But right now, I feel like we don't even have a solid foundation. And so when you don't have that solid foundation, anything in it and everything that's thrown at you, that's thrown at you, then we put it back on the team. And if our priority is really about supporting teaching and learning and improving student achievement, but yet we keep pulling staff with, a, you know, 100 different questions that they have to take time out of doing the work of teaching and learning to respond to questions that we then don't even apply to governance or that the entire board may not even wanted to know to inform the governance decision, then was that a valuable use of staff time? And was that the best way to serve our students? So that's all um, I'm saying there. And I think that the matrix or framework that we've talked about, you know, several times throughout this meeting may be a way for us to capture what are those salient points that we need to know before approving, you know, a contract. I mean, I sat there as I went through the PowerPoint, I've done my own kind of research, just looking for the pros and the cons. What are the, because to me, OG is the method, and these are two different vendors with two different packages. And what about each of these packages is a pro and which is a con um, and which is going to, give us the best results, which we didn't talk a lot about progress monitoring and the results that we may have from using Bauman for a number of years. So um, I don't think we're finished this, but I do think that that framework or met metrics may help us um, do what you um, just described. So it is 5.59, I'm not sure how we did that, but we did. So um, is there any <laughs> further business? Okay, so the last item on the agenda is announcements. Um, the next curriculum committee meeting is scheduled for June 13th. Um, and since there is no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thanks um, to all the committee members for doing your homework and for preparing for this meeting. And thank you for staff for putting together everything that you have. It, it definitely took a lot of time and we appreciate it. Um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.